Hello and welcome to the results video for Double Trouble, a No Limits 2 contest I held on the website No Limits Central over the summer. The brief was to restart the transportable coaster scene with a bang by creating not one, but two transportable roller coaster designs. One of them was to be the modern day answer to the classics such as Olympia Looping, and the second would be a fresh take on the Farrelly orientated design that manages to pack a punch in such a small footprint. We've had some very interesting entries, and joining me to help present the top 5 and honourable mentions is the one and only Coasterbot. Whoa, that's me! I'm excited to be here judging. It's been really interesting to look at the work in progress photos, and I can't wait to share some of the final results. Before we go over the top 5, let's have a look at the two honourable mentions. First up, we have Meteor and Crazy Mouse by AK Coaster. The Schwarzkopf certainly looks the part, with the interlocking loops being a really good focal point. The shaping is a bit pumpy, with some forces going slightly over the safe boundaries, but the layout itself is nicely done, with excellent space usage. A couple other minor things, like the first brake section being very similar to the height of the first loop were also pointed out by the judges, but definitely a valiant effort. The spinning wild mouse was definitely an eye catcher too, with its large swooping drops, and also some really excellent support work. The only detractor was the capacity concerns, and some of the spinning being neutered by the banked turns. And secondly, it's Driva and Orange Tree Shuttle Spin by Kreov. Fitting what is an imposing and large looking dive coaster into such a small plot of land was a real feat. The use of a B&M Giga coaster spine on the first drop really adds to its size too. Although, like many dive coasters, the ride suffers from repetition. Three near vertical drops are squeezed between two MCBRs, leading to a bit of a start-stop experience. Nevertheless, a smooth and well-shaped dive coaster is incredibly impressive given the scale. Orange Tree Shuttle Spin was a unique take on a familiar ride. Pairing a spinning train with a boomerang style layout adds a lot of value to what is normally a very standard attraction. Though the layout could have been a bit more exciting, the concept alone is enough to make me want to try it out in real life. And now for the top 5. At number 5 we have Infinity and Crazy Mouse by Jammy. While not the flashiest, Infinity is by far one of the most well presented rides in the competition. The red colour on the Infinity symbol within the layout was a very nice touch, which makes the coaster visually striking from the ground. Little things like the bunny hill after the dive loops to leave the view of the main element unobstructed, and the really good supports on the roll over the station were also pointed out by judges. The things holding Miss Coaster back were mainly the repetitiveness of the inversions, but other than that a very solid and grounded in reality coaster. Similar can be said for Crazy Mouse, however, despite the execution and realism it was by far the thing that dragged the overall entry down. The spinning car seemed out of place, almost like an afterthought, as if it was a family coaster that had been retrofitted. The space usage was also notably poor, with lots of open space between track sections. Definitely an overall good effort, just needed a bit more flavour on both coasters to push it higher up the rankings. In number 4 is Jackson G's Darkfire and Tsunami Surfer. Now, these rides are mental. If the brief was pack as much track into the area as possible, Jackson wins by a mile. Darkfire has bucket loads of speed and interesting elements, including a well thought out roll into the mid course. Fitting so many modern inversions into such a small space really shows off the ingenuity of the design. Though the layout is impressive, it is also perhaps a little long. Repetition of elements towards the end of the ride hinders the overall experience and perhaps its ability to be transported around effectively. The story of density simply continues with Jackson's second ride, Tsunami Surfer. I thought I knew what a compact spinning coaster looked like. I was wrong. This thing is compact, like incredibly compact. But that's just one feature. Adding a launch to a spinning coaster levels up the experience, especially since you'll be traveling at speed through the web of supports. Although, it perhaps suffers in similar ways to Darkfire. Does more track in this case equal a better experience, especially considering it's a travelling coaster? Nevertheless, the ambitious approach for both of these rides definitely paid off. The third spot has been taken by what is by far the most unique of the entries, Esho and De Vodome Windmolen. Don't let it slightly rough around the edges look for you though. 
Despite the slightly unfinished nature of the scenery, this was an instant hit with all the judges. I don't think any of them expected to see a Maura spike in the contest, nor a ferris wheel lift, but here we are. The figure 8 element really sticks out as the highlight on Airshow, both in visuals and ride experience. It was a clever choice to make it a powered coaster, probably one of the few ways to even pull off a figure 8 loop element. However, with it being a Mara spike, some areas may feel uncomfortable at slower speed if it's rider controlled. The rest of the layout is also spaced out really well, and the supports are excellently designed with maybe one small exception. On the slightly more standard side of things, we have Derva Dome Windmolen, which unfortunately was not completely finished in time. Since the judging criteria specifically said that scenery isn't affecting the scores, the unfinished date is a non-factor. However, it is hoped that the show building is fully finished at some point in the future. Aside from the very cool ferris wheel lift, the layout is pretty standard for a girth last spinning coaster, but very well thought out. The biggest attractor was easily the supports though, with a lot of seemingly unneeded structures and a couple of clearance fails in areas. With a little more time, this entry could have potentially placed a lot higher though, but this still doesn't take away the one-of-a-kind aspect both coasters have. Second place goes to Fintamin and their entries Shooting Star and Speedway, two rides that really stand out for their realism and execution. Firstly, Shooting Star nails the off-ride experience perfectly. The Skyrush style drop, followed by a zero-g stall which seems to hang over the edge of the ride's plot, would certainly draw crowds. This is followed in turn by a well-balanced layout with a variety of both airtime and inversions. Although the ride isn't the most innovative, nor the layout incredibly creative, the ride is incredibly real. I found myself wondering why Gerstlauer hadn't already built this roller coaster, because it's exactly something they would do. Bintamin's second coaster, Speedway, continues the same trends. The ride is incredibly well designed and thought out. Combining the launch with motorbank style trains makes the experience more unique. This is followed by a compact layout, which allows the ride to maintain speed throughout. Vintamin has taken all the best bits from real-world motor coasters and made sure to include plenty of them here, such as a plethora of slaloms. The space-conscious design and vibrant colour scheme make it an attractive ride for everyone. Both Shooting Star and Speedway are a masterclass in how to design roller coasters with a focus on reality, which is why they were my personal favourites. And finally, the top spot goes to this incredible entry by PVM, Mad Hatter and Dragonfly. Mad Hatter is absolutely bananas, seemingly going gold in every aspect from the contest. From the ground, the absolute chaos and density of the layout looks incredible from all angles, and would easily draw a large viewing crowd, let alone the people who would actually want to ride it. The interlocking elements of the banana and cobra roll were a highlight for one of the judges, and also the clever placement of the mid-course brake runs being at all above the station. The triple launch makes for an excellent build-up and is a fantastic way to gain full momentum within the small footprint. The ride itself never lets up the pace, and the unique element of a sideways loop fits the absolute wackiness of the ride to a T. The supports are also absolutely on point, with an extremely efficient structure plan that uses no more steel than it would need. The balance between realism and originality hit the spot, however, there were a few things to note near the end of the ride. There were some overly sharp transitions that may be uncomfortable to riders, and the drop off of the first mid course in the back row may also be a little bit too much on the aggressive side, but those are very much nitpicking to say the least. Over in the other corner, we have Dragonfly, and while not as flashy as Mad Hatter, it's also a very solid design. With a bit more thrill than your traditional family coaster, it's impressive how much of a large box B&M track was able to be squeezed into the relatively small plot given. It must be said that the ending to the ride does feel a bit sudden, but there was not a lot of space left to work with so there wasn't too much that could be done about that. Track shaping was also not quite the same standard as Mad Hatter, but still a really solid job overall. And that's the end of Double Trouble. I would like to extend my thank you to everybody who took part, and while we only received 9 entries, each of them offered a really interesting take on the brief, and props must be given for filling all of the contest challenging requirements. Hopefully, this has inspired others to maybe create their own take on this idea, or create their own ground-up travelling coaster design. <laughs>